You know, theology for some people is quite a simple matter, even, even puerile. They find humor and irony in the subject, like George Carlin, who says, religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of the day. And the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do. <laughs> and if you do any of these 10 things, he has a special place <laughs> full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever until the end of time. But he loves you. <laughs> The, the infamous triumvirate of atheists, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, all agree on the irrationality of belief and the failure of faith to stand up to the light of science. Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, perhaps the most popular of this new canon of anti-religious fervor that tries putting the final nails into God's coffin may best be summarized as, as pure disdain for any of life's mysteries that isn't empirically proven. I have mentioned from this pulpit on past occasions that I never really appreciated the disparaging remarks on religion and faith and theology by three men who throw meaningless darts at the God, not a God, not a God but at the God described by George Carlin, the invisible man in the sky. Now living well into the 21st century now with advances in science and technology, those innovations, I mean, they are really quite amazing, very much so. And their, the atheist's cartoon characterization of God not only lacks sophistication, but you know, very few people actually adhere to their image of God, the God that they're attacking. In fact, most people with religious affiliations in mainline churches and, and synagogues of all stripes have, have abandoned this very simplistic notion of God having human features and emotions and a God who, who just relishes sitting up there passing judgment. I prefer Karen Armstrong's more embracing approach when she writes that the science of our day makes classical theism impossible for many people. To cling to the old theology, she writes, is not only a failure of nerve, but could involve a damaging loss of integrity. Indeed, old theology and contemporary science are incompatible. And yet the old theology offered more than myth. It also understood some of the basic tenets of life like human propensities towards greed and destructive behavior. The old theology, aside from just fantastic stories that defy all natural law, also discern a framework, a framework in which human beings, now and then, people of all time, experience and relate to the vicissitudes of life. So people back with thousands of years when the, the beginnings of Old Testament theology began to people today, you know, we understand that we are inept, we make mistakes, we bungle things up in embarrassing ways. We've come to understand for thousands of years, nothing has changed, that we are fragile beings vulnerable beings. And theology addresses the, the universal sentiment, regardless if we consider ourselves to be atheists or humanists, religious liberals, 
progressive thinkers, rational folks, we feel the tension between screwing things up and wanting to save our butts. You know, part of the, the whole human package we have come to realize is an undeniable tendency for getting things wrong, either because we are careless or greedy or unthinking, and somebody else suffers as a result, and it usually comes back to hurt us as well. Now, Unitarians generally rail against the term sin. It's in our anti-Calvinist nature. But basically, that's what we're talking about. Sin does not have to have the, the consequences as described by George Carlin, like experiencing the fires of hell for all eternity. But whenever a moral law is transgressed, especially if done so deliberately for selfish gains, then at some point we begin to feel some remorse and we are aware of somehow having stepped beyond the boundary that, that delineates good from bad, right from wrong. Theologically, temptations are a mighty force with which we must contend. Temptation to prosper at the cost of doing harm to others. Prompt us to disobey what we inherently know to be the right thing to do. And then what? I mean, is there, is there a price exacted for our disobedience? Do, do we somehow pay for this? Pay for not following the, the moral path? How do we get out of this uncomfortable mess? I mean, what or who will rescue us since we merely human beings apparently are incapable of rescuing ourselves? How will we, in the best sense of the word, how will we be saved in this conundrum of selfish behavior that bore such heavy and perilous consequences. Now theologically, the sin-salvation axis plays out in myriad ways. We transgress a moral tenet, trouble ensues, and then we look for a way out of the mess that we've created. And this dilemma happens all the time, even to atheists. They are not immune from, from poor judgments or selfish acts. Theists and non-theists alike can relate to the emotion, that, that deep down feeling of seeking deliverance from some outside source, seeking a deliverance from our sins, a, a ray of hope despite our transgression. In mythic form, it looks something like this. The Son of God dies on the cross, and it is his death that atones for our sins. It's God's gift to a messed up human race. And even though we don't really deserve such magnanimous gifts, God offers us, let's call it, an escape clause for all our wrong and hurtful actions. The Christian axiom is that all we need to do is accept the formula of Jesus dying for our sins and our soul receives salvation. And so for, for people who carry this, this literal perception of the myth, religion requires of them a faith. And faith is an important term which we're going to get to in a moment. What is required of them is a faith in the premise that the gift of salvation will come, and that salvation means transforming men and women to follow good lives and become righteous in the eyes of God. And to be righteous in the eyes of God can only help your case 
when the final judgment comes. So when humans mess up, there's divine help that can restore confidence in ourselves and in the world. The Invisible Man in the George Carlin script has, has a list of ten things he doesn't want you to do. Of course, these are sins, these are transgressions, they're all, they're all spelled out. Sin is when we steal, murder, commit adultery, or somehow break God's commandment. It's essentially the bad things that we do. That we do. But in the epistle of James, chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not, to him it is sin. So sin is not only what we do, it's what we don't do. That's so Unitarian, isn't it? <laughs> what do you mean you didn't go to the clean air rally last Saturday? What's wrong with you? That's sinful. What do you mean you didn't attend the Equality Utah dinner? What's wrong? What do you mean you don't drive an electric car or have solar, solar panels on your house? What's wrong? You can't just stand there. You've got to do something. For sins of omission, sins of omission, just as dangerous to your soul as are the acts of transgression. Now, we who do not buy into the Christian myths nevertheless understand the tensions that develop internally when we transgress, and we all do. And then there's, there's a faith. That's that term, faith, again. There is a faith that we have that somehow we will be rescued. The faith in being rescued is, is universally human. So if it's not God, it's going to rescue us. Because we, we've dismissed that concept of an invisible man in the sky. Then who or what will deliver us from our sins? You see, faith is not limited to religious people. We all need to have a level of confidence, and really that's all that faith really means. We need to have a level of confidence that transgressions will be dealt with in a manner which will allow us to continue, to continue strong. We, liberal, empirical, Rational people also look, if you pardon the expression, we too look for salvation. But instead of turning to the invisible man, we turn to science and technology to offer us the gift of deliverance. We have sinned gravely in our transgression against the natural world. And this includes sins of harvesting the earth's resources for personal gain without concern for the subsequent environmental degradation. These also include sins of omission, whereby we know what actions and responsibilities we need to assume, but we fail to do so. Will the Gods of technology save us from our unconscionable predicament. 